Does hypocrisy bother you? It bothered Jesus. In fact, Jesus uses some of his strongest language to talk about hypocrites. Jesus described hypocrites as truth blocking, rabble rousing, rules lowering, cherry picking, two faced, mask wearing, self righteous people. Would you like to avoid being one? I know I would. So in this talk, what we're going to do is we're going to discover what hypocrisy is according to Jesus and how we can put up some guardrails against a, a hypocrisy to try and avoid it. Because while we all desire authenticity, I think, if we were honest, we all struggle with hypocrisy. So let's learn together. Why don't you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we ask that you would open up your word to us, help us to understand this, help us to make sense of this. Uh, you, you say some pretty harsh things in this passage we're about to read. It feels a little hard to talk about the harsh words you say on a long weekend when we're trying to remember uh, those who have uh, sacrificed their lives for us, but also enjoy a weekend that kind of kicks off our summer. So please speak to us by your word. So we might uh, hear, learn, and put it into practice. We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. So we're continuing our series in Matthew. We're at Matthew 23, and we're getting into some really tough chapters in Matthew. Uh, Matthew 23, uh, Jesus is beginning to talk to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in a very pointed uh, fashion. Uh, we've seen this debate that he went through. Uh, now we're stepping into uh, um, him challenging them. And then next week, we kick off a new series about the end times from Matthew, as we look at how Jesus describes the end times. Uh, so really tough passages coming up. But if you think about the way Matthew wrote his gospel, he actually wrote his gospel to mirror the, uh, the Jewish scriptures. So in the beginning, we read about the genealogy of Jesus, and, and we see mirrors of Genesis in that uh, Jesus uh, being uh, uh, Jesus creating the world, Jesus' lineage, uh, uh, genealogy as he uh, is shown to come from Abraham, the flight to Egypt to represent the journey of Israel, uh, the teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, which is like the delivery of the law to the Israelites in Exodus, uh, the parables and the stories of Jesus and uh, the accounts of his healings try to paint a picture of God at work in Israel from the uh, time of the Torah through the narrative writings of Israel. And this passage that we're going to get to, Matthew 23, is very reminiscent of the prophets. Jesus is stepping into his prophetic role, delivering prophecy. Now, here's the thing about prophecy. Most people think prophecy is about foretelling, about telling what the future is going to be. Jesus does that a little bit later, which we'll look at in the next series. But a lot of prophecy is actually foretelling, telling the people where they have gone off rails or de, uh, got, got distracted from the law of God. So if you look at the prophets, often they are speaking to the Israelite nation, to Ju uh, Judea or Israel, to Judah or, or Israel, telling them where they have gone off track, pointing out how they have forgotten the law of God or where they are in error. Jesus speaks very much like a prophet in these passages that we're going to look at. Uh, now, he uses a word that he repeats over and over again, also sometimes misunderstood, and the word is woe. Woe to you, Pharisees. Woe to you, blind guides. Woe to you, teachers of the law. That is often translated as a judgment word. Woe, you're judged. Woe is you. Uh, parents use that, not really that language, but kind of when they look at the kids, woe is you if you dare do, if you come home after curfew, woe is you. Uh, it's, but that's not the essence of the word. The essence of the word is a mixture of emotion. Woe, according to one uh, commentary, is a mixed cry of regret, so a little bit of sadness in there, compassion, anger moving you to action, sorrow, and denunciation. It's not just judgment. It's almost a word of loving warning. Be careful, you're on dangerous ground. And Jesus is going to talk about this dangerous ground that he sees the Pharisees in. 
and he's going to use the word hypocrite. That word is, flow, is thrown around today all over the place, thrown at people. And it's often thrown at people when they fail to live up to their high ideals. That is not hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is not having a high ideals and failing to live up to them. What that is, is failure, not hypocrisy. The word hypocrite comes from the Greek word for actor. It means to wear a mask to pretend to be something when actually you're something else. Do you get the distinction? It's a vital distinction when we talk about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy means you're playing a role, you're pretending. It means that there's within you conscious determination to present yourself as someone else, as someone you aren't. It's filled with deceit and manipulation. There's a big difference about what a failed uh, aspiration is and what a manipulative aspiration is. So make sure we understand that distinction. It really means doing the right things for the wrong reasons. I'm going to do these things so that I can be po uh, favorable in front of a crowd. I'm going to do these things so that I can win your, your, your friendship or win you over. But I don't really believe what I'm saying. I don't really believe what I'm uh, pretending to be. That's hypocrisy. And you're going to see how Jesus pulls it out. And so to remind you again, what does Jesus call his opponents? Truth blocking, rabble rousing, rules lowering, cherry picking, two-faced, mask wearing, self-righteous hypocrites. Seven woes, seven titles, seven ways to avoid the big idea for today. Which if you get nothing else, get this from what Jesus is saying. Don't be a hypocrite. If you can get that right, you've got the message down. Okay, But here's the challenge. I think we all uh, have fears and allow our fears to play into us. And so when we look at these, it may point out within you, because it certainly did for me point out where I have engaged in hypocrisy. And so a good thing to do when you uncover that is to come before God and go, I see what you've highlighted. I see what you're pointing out, Holy Spirit. I see what you're uh, showing where I'm in error confess it, and then step back out into a different way. So let's have a look at those words. Truth blocking. Where does Jesus call the, uh, the people in front of him hypocrites, truth blockers? It comes from Matthew 23, verse 13, where he starts, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, not, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. What he's highlighting here is the Pharisees knew who Jesus was. They believed he was from God. They believed that he had been sent by God. They actually believed that he was the Messiah. You know why I say that? Because when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, one of the things Nicodemus, a Pharisee, says to Jesus is, we know you're from God, but we're afraid of the people. Knowing the truth that Jesus was from God the Pharisees were not willing to go down that road because it meant surrendering their own privilege and position. They refused to go down that road, but they not only didn't go down that road themselves, they made sure nobody else could get there either. They're hypocrites. Do you have that in your life? Do you see that somewhere around you? Do you have people that are like that? They know the right thing to do, but they just refuse to do it. And not only that, they stop you from doing it. It's hard to navigate through that when you just know the right thing to do, but it means losing something when you make that choice, losing something when you make that step. I find that incredibly tough. It's really tough to, in today's world because so often when you say something or do something that puts you out there, especially with social media, really puts you out there into a position of danger. So it's hard to follow the truth. I know that sounds weird to say, but it really is hard sometimes, especially when the truth is going to cost you something. So a way to avoid this level of hypocrisy uh, is humble, sincere evaluation. Am I right in my thinking? Am I understanding what is going on correctly? Am I following this properly? Do I understand what is happening? Humble, sincere evaluation. Just looking at what you believe is right and how you're acting and saying, is this the right way to do it? 
It is astounding how often I have to do that as a pastor because you, you're constantly in our interactions uh, in the world with people. We're constantly faced as pastors with having to assess, is my position right? Uh, I'm a part of the Framingham Interfaith uh, Association and we spend a lot of time interacting together. Uh, and, and, and this is so tough to do because there's lots of different faiths present in that interfaith circle. Uh, the Framingham city is filled with faiths from, um, uh, there's a, a Muslim a reading uh, temple. They don't, it's not, it's, they don't have a mosque because they don't have a, a, um, an imam yet. So there's a, a, a Muslim reading temple. There's a Sikh temple. Uh, there's obviously a Jewish and Christian and a, a range of Christian denominations involved. It breaks my heart when I see pastors in town who talk about loving, who talk about caring, but just won't engage with other people of other faiths. There's such an opportunity to have conversation in that space. It says something that if we're loving and we're not willing to engage with people different than us because they don't fit our uh, level of truth or our understanding of truth, we're beginning to step into this I think, I think we're beginning to step into this truth-blocking challenge that Jesus presents. You know the truth, but you just won't do it. And not only that, you won't let other people do it. So when somebody tries to be loving, we stop them because they're not doing it the right way. It's kind of what Jesus is saying. Then he calls them rabble-rousing. Rabble-rousing is, is an interesting word. It means to rile up a crowd, right? To get them going, to get them uh, chanting or saying things that, uh, uh, that will get them excited and doing things that you want. It means to incite people towards an agenda. And the good rebel rousers know that when they're with a the crowd, you know you start saying things that the crowd likes. So you don't go to uh, watch... Um, uh, Boston Celtics play Miami Heat in Miami and start chanting the Celtics uh, slogans if you want to be healthy, right, <laughs> at the end of the game. Only the real fans do that, the ones who are out there. Uh, the person who's the hypocrite, who would be the Celtic fan who goes there, wears white and chants and cheers and uh, puts a flag over, uh, a white towel over their head so that they can get in favor with everybody else and rouse them up. It's fake. They're acting. So here's what Jesus says to the Pharisees. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child as hell as you are. That's a little aggressive, Jesus. <laughs> they're a child of hell. Not only that, they're twice as much a child of hell. You see, what would happen is the Pharisees spent a lot of time putting attention on how much evangelistic effort they did. They would travel to go and win people over. But they weren't interested in winning people over to Judaism or to uh, worshiping God. They wanted to win people over to their position. So they would spend a lot of time persuading people to agree with a specific type of truth, a specific type of understanding, a specific type of uh, faith, a worldview, for lack of a better word. And they would do that in such a way that they would create within those followers zealousy that would be even greater than theirs. Jesus says, be careful when you're just trying to rabble-rouse people to your position or your point of view. When you do that, you're making a mistake. For Christians, we have to be careful that when we share our faith with others, when we invite others into a relationship with Christ, that we're inviting them into a relationship with a person, not into a system of thinking. Jesus has already shown through Matthew that God is the only one who knows his plan clearly and understands it fully. Everybody else has a grasp at it or an understanding, but not fully. And so when we go and speak with others, we have to be so careful that we evaluate what we're inviting them to participate in. Is it just to our position? Is it just to our point of view? Or are we inviting them into a relationship with Christ? And one of the things that is helpful to do as a 
a way to avoid hypocrisy is when you are inviting somebody into a relationship with Christ, when you are evangelizing or witnessing, evaluate them according to the Christ-likeness that is in the Bible rather than their agreement with the position. Does that make sense? That's what we want to invite people to, is this relationship with Christ and let them follow Christ and understand Christ as God, Christ interacts with them. Not to see if they can check a bunch of boxes. Historically, the ch- this might be a little weird for some people and uh, I mean, you might want to say like I've given up on the faith of Christianity when I share this. I really haven't, but I want to show you something that happened historically in the church. For the first two to 300 years of the church, people were called into relationship with Christ around a single belief, an event. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. We are eyewitnesses of this fact. Here's our story recorded in a gospel, shared, copied multiple times. And in fact, Paul will write and say, some of these people are still alive, go and talk to them. Christianity for a, the longest time was about belief in an event. Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again. As Christianity grew, people began to debate that event and debate who Jesus was. So there were people who said Jesus wasn't real. He wasn't really a human. He, became, he was a ghost that kind of walked around. Others said he didn't really come to life. That was just a metaphor of what God is doing. So there were all these different thought patterns that began to break out. And so people began to say, well, what is true? And we began to write things out called creeds, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed. Now, the creeds are not bad in and of themselves, but here's a subtle thing that began to happen around 300 and 400 AD. People were asked to agree with a creed regardless of whether they believed in the event. Do you believe that Jesus was born of a Virgin Mary? Do you believe and, uh, that, uh, you know, our God is uh, the Holy Spirit? Do you believe that uh, uh, he was uh, persecuted? Uh, do you believe that Pontius Pilate put him to death? Like, it was about agreement with a sense of creeds, but what was happening is an external check mark, but an internal lack of belief in an event. Jesus is saying that is not where we should go. Jesus is saying with this saying rabble rousers, it's not about it being able to mentally agree with a bunch of creeds. It's about putting your life on the line about an event. It's a matter of faith, not a matter of agreement. Does that make sense as I'm trying to explain that? Because that's what the, Fa- the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were doing. They were winning people over to their point of view regardless of whether they actually followed the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So don't be a rabble rouser. Well, how about this one, rules lawyering? You know that expression, right? You ever played a game with somebody who always wants to debate the rules? No? Just me? <laughs> I'm that person? What do the rules say? What are the, what's, uh, what's the exact wording of the rule? Now, you know why we rules lawyer? So that we can find a way to win. The word says to, uh, the word says a, not the, therefore I can do this because it gives opportunity. And you begin to debate about little things. So here's what the Pharisees did. Woe to you blind guides, Jesus says. Interesting phrase though, because you know what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes were called? They were supposed to be the people who led people into the light. They were supposed to be the ones who could see. And he says, you're blind guides. You're the blind leading the blind. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by the oath. So you want to make an oath? You want to make a promise? Don't swear by the temple. That's not good. Make sure you swear by the gold of the temple. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? 
Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Here's what they were doing. They were entering into honest dishonesty. Will you make a promise with me? Sure, I'll swear by the temple on it. And then when they were asked to honor that promise, that's not a binding oath. Only if I swear by the gold is it binding. We do that today. Swear on your mother's life. Will you swear on the Bible? As though every other time you make a promise isn't real, as long as you swear on the Bible. Whereas Jesus, early on, we know in Matthew says, if you're a follower of mine, let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Let your word be binding because you are a person of, of integrity, of honor, not because of what you swear by. So they were rules lawyering. They were engaging in honest dishonesty. They were trying to just uh, find ways to not be bound by promises and get away with it. And Jesus is calling them out on it. Simple way to avoid this, be honest. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Obviously do it in love, which is why Paul says speak the truth in love, but be honest about what, what you say. How about cherry picking? Here's what Jesus says about cherry picking. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Weird expression, right? Here's what they were doing. They were spending a lot of time looking at specific laws and taking them to an absurd level. Cumin, dill, and mint, according to the law, were, uh, you, you, you didn't have to count out every grain because they were so small, uh, but it was a, the, the idea was make sure you're accounting for those. But they would take ages counting out how much their cumin weighed and then give a tenth in order to show everybody they were teaching, look, you need to give, give a tenth, give everything. But while doing all of their time on that, they didn't care about justice. They didn't care about mercy or faithfulness. Jesus says, honor the one and the other. Don't neglect one or the other. Don't pick what you follow. Don't look at my laws or look at how I'm teaching or following you or guide, uh, leading you and pick what you want to follow. No, follow all of it. And that little thing about you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel, both a gnat and a camel were considered unclean. But in that day and age, wine would often be filled with gnats. So you would pour the wine through a, a mesh filter, like some, uh, uh, what's the word for it? Morselin, I think is the phrase that you pour through. And you would capture the insects on it so that the wine would be saved. Uh, but Jesus is trying to say, you, you're doing that, but this issue of Justice is like eating a whole camel while you're avoiding eating a fly. Don't cherry pick. Be careful of doing that. Focus on both for true godliness. Here's the interesting thing I find about this. The Pharisees spent a lot of time telling people about tithing because they benefited from that. They were priests. And they, uh, when, when is, the Israelite nation gave uh, uh, they tithe, gave their offering, they benefited from it. So it was in their best interest to make sure you gave a tenth of everything because they benefited. You know some people like that who pick how you should be with them so that they benefit? Do you do that? It's a little harder to navigate. How about two-faced? And I don't mean Batman's opponent. Two-faced. How did they operate as two-faced? Here's what Jesus says. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. The Pharisees used to make a big deal of cleaning uh, their, their pottery and their, their crockery. And it, they, they would engage in a ceremonial cleaning of it. And Jesus is saying, 
you do that and you dress the right way and you act the right way, everything outside looks good, but inside, it's kind of like eating from a dirty dish. And it's just uncomfortable. It's just wrong. It's two-faced. It's wearing a mask. Be careful that you don't do that. It's a pretty direct uh, challenge to them. What Jesus is saying is your righteousness needs to come from the inside out. Your right living needs to come from your relationship with Christ, not from pretending. So take a moment and think about your relationship and why you do the things you do. Why do you read the Bible if you read it in a devotion? Why do you attend church? Why do you serve? Are you doing it because it's the right thing to do because it looks good? Or are you doing it out of a desire to honor Jesus and to live out that righteousness that comes from within? That's what Jesus is saying. Do it from the right way. Ground your faith on where your soul is rather than in specific acts or actions. Pretty direct challenge. It's a little tough to just move over these quickly because really each one probably deserves an hour's thought and reflection. Where am I off track with this, Lord? Where am I wrong? This one and the next one hit pretty close to home for me. How about mask wearing? This false pretense of faith that Jesus highlights. Here he gets really pointed with the Pharisees, as though he hasn't been pointed yet. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. I would hate Jesus to say that to me. Dorian, you are a whitewashed tomb. And when I look at my life, I sometimes feel like, you know what, Jesus? You, it just cuts a little close to home. I need to work that out. I need to find where I'm off track. I need to find where I'm not doing the right thing and, and where I'm pretending and get rid of that mask. Confession is such a valuable Christian discipline, a spiritual discipline that allows us to come to God and honestly and openly say, I have blown it. I'm far from you. Jesus, come into this tomb, come into where I'm dead and make me alive. Once again, like the former one about two-faced, this is about grounding your, your faith on where your soul is, not where you wished it was or where you hope it is or where you pretend it to be, but where it actually is. Don't be a hypocrite, Jesus says. Don't wear a mask. Don't block the truth. Don't rouse people to a point of view. Don't try to find a way through the rules. Don't pick the rules that you want to follow. Don't be two-faced. Don't be mask wearing. Don't be, which is the last one, self-righteous. Here's what Jesus says to them. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. We call this moral superiority. When we look back at people from the past and go, I would never have done that. We think about it, just let's talk about our own church history. The first, I've shared this with you before, the first part, lead pastor of Faith Community Church back when it was First Congregational Church owned slaves. We look back and go, I would never have done that. Would we? Would we have been any different back then? Would we have been any different than the followers of Jesus when he said, you're all gonna run away from me? Would we have stood by his side or would we have run? I don't know about you, but it's very hard for me to look back at the past and go, I'm better than them. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They would look back at the history of Israel and go, we would not have killed the prophets. We would have understood what they were saying and followed them. Even though everybody else went one way, we would have not. Surprisingly, right in front of them is a prophet saying, follow me, and they're denying it. 
So Jesus says, you testify against yourselves that you're the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. You snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Happy Memorial's Day, everybody. <laughs> Self-righteousness is a disease in the Christian church. We walk around as Christians and declare how much better we are than anybody else. That Framingham Interfaith community that I'm a part of, I'm one of the few pastors from a Christian Protestant church that attends that. There are over 100 churches here. I'm one of the few. We talk about love and interaction, but we won't even sit down and have a meal with people who are people of faith, never mind a community uh, that is filled with people who are skeptical and antagonistic against Christianity. How will we win people to faith if we won't sit and have a meal with them? And that illustration makes me sound so much better than I actually am. <laughs> I don't mean it that way, and I apologize for that. We have to be wary of moral superiority and self-righteousness. And Peter gives a great example of this. He says, acknowledge your sinfulness. Acknowledge where you're weak. Acknowledge where you're far from God. And guard yourself. Because, he says, the devil is roaming around like a roaring lion, waiting to devour. And we think he's waiting to devour with these terrible, evil things, calling people in. But actually, he's way smarter than that. He's waiting to devour us when we think we've just made it as we step over and go, I'm so much better, right there. So Jesus warns, don't be a hypocrite. Be careful of doing this. Be careful of falling this way. I wanna skip over what he says here because he begins to talk and he uses an interesting expression. He talks about a loving hen. And I love this description. It's the same image that is used by the writer of Genesis Back in Genesis 1, when he talks about the spirit hovering over the waters, about a hen hovering over her chicks or over eggs. And here's what Jesus says. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here's what Jesus is saying. I've pointed out your hypocrisy. I've pointed out where you sidetracked. I've pointed out where you're drifting. I see how the city that calls itself after my name, that calls itself after my father, that declares it loves my father, I see it drifting and how I wish you would come back. This is the heart of God revealed to us. When Jesus gives these woes, it's not anger at us. It's not judgment. It's not throwing us out. It's not saying to us, "Get, I can't stand you. I'm going to spit you out. He's saying instead, pay attention. I'm highlighting all of these things so that you'd see, I want you back. I want a relationship where we would be open. But you reject me, Jerusalem. I want to love you. I want to fold you in. But you want nothing to do with me. And when you reject me, something else moves in. Anger, bitterness, pride, a critical spirit, all those things come in and we begin to miss what God is doing. God's heart is broken when we are hypocrites, but he's also broken when we deny that we're there. It's, he's broken when we don't come close to him. He longs to return to uh, us and be in a space with us where we can engage and love and care for each other. So I don't know of those seven descriptions, which one makes you uncomfortable? Where did you feel a twinge for yourself? Where did you feel like Jesus was saying, this is you? Well, we're gonna conclude our service by having a time of confession through communion. We're gonna invite the band up to come and get ready. But I want to to take us and guide us through communion so that you would have an opportunity at your tables to go before Jesus, who is a loving hen who wants 
to gather you under his wings. He wants to protect you and keep you warm and build a relationship with you. He wants that with you. So we're going to take a moment in communion where we will reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus who made a way for us to be with him, where we will remember the event of his death and the promise of his resurrection. And then as you eat the bread and drink the cup, remember the invitation and respond as is appropriate for you. If it's confession where you have, as I've been speaking, you feel God saying, this is a place where I am off track, confess that and come back into a right relationship with him. If it's a way for you to strengthen or, or, or increase the intimacy of that relationship, do so. But you take the time you need